Yo, what's up, everybody? I'm Ryan J. Downey. Welcome to another episode of The Deep Dive, where we sit down with an artist, go through their discography, and talk about the who, what, when, where, and why of the various albums. My guest in this episode is Blasco. Yay! What up? What's going on, man? <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that in. I don't. Know, I don't know if you've seen Bill Maher in the last few weeks, but he's been he's been doing his monologue in his backyard and then cutting in fake crowds. From I haven't seen it, but but it makes sense because I've watched a you know a, a handful of bands doing live streams, and the and the silence between songs is so deafening. It's to a, where I I think I told one band I go, hey man, if you do that again, you just got to put a fake crowd like in between songs, like. Like, I know it sounds ridiculous, but you guys have a good sense of humor. So I think yeah. it would work. For certain <laughs> yeah. bands, it could work for sure. Or for if, sure. If you're a more vibey, like atmospheric kind of band, like get some interludes and lights, yes. and, you know, do something. But like, you yes. can't, that weird, awkward silence. I will say, um, watching UFC for the first time a couple of weeks ago without an audience, at first, my friends and I were all like, Whoa, this is, this is weird. But then I got really into it. And it was like, you know what? This is like, you can, you can hear more, you can see more. It's more intimate. It's like you're okay. almost in the ring. Um, yeah. Because yeah, there isn't any crowd. I mean, there's, there's no crowd. <laughs> it's yeah. just, it's yeah. literally quiet except for the announcers calling the fight and the, the two fighters. It's kind of awesome. Oh, that's and cool. Now I'm like, yeah. maybe they'll let's keep it that way. I like it. Whereas, yeah. No disrespect to wrestling fans, because I have many, many friends, as I'm sure you do, who love wrestling. But I don't know how they, how they can hang with the no audience wrestling. I mean, professional no, wrestling seems no like it's way. all about, I mean, how do you, you know, you can't, can't do. It for, sh it for sure is. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, just, that's, that's a rough one. Super weird. So I want to jump into the discography, which, which is quite rich and diverse with you. Um, most people watching this will undoubtedly know you as the bass player for Ozzy Osbourne, and they perhaps might know you as the manager for Black Veil Brides and Zach Wilde and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but you were also uh, one of the founding members of the Rob Zombie solo band. But your career goes even further back than that. And I want to point out that you're still not an old man. You just started. <laughs> you're very kind. You just started really young. <laughs> so True. You know, there's some, uh, this is the bizarre tangents I tend to go on, but back when Everlast and Eminem were feuding, which was 2000, October 2000, I remember because it was my, it was the first story I ever reported on for MTV News. Um, Eminem, part of his whole attack is he kept calling Everlast old and washed up and nobody wants to hear your old ass sing no more and whatever. Everlast is only like three years older than Eminem. But the difference is Eminem was just kind of at his ascent. And Everlast right. had already been Everlast with the Rhyme Syndicate, album on Warner Brothers, House of Pain, three albums, broke up, and was now putting out his second, like, Everlast, Whitey Ford, Sings the Blues style album. That's because he started when he was 16. <laughs> So right. you have that also. When we look at your discography, it's like, wow, this dude's been doing it. But um, but you were a kid in your first real band, which was Cryptic Slaughter. Tell me, set the stage for people about Cryptic Slaughter and, you know, that era of, I mean, your first record came out in 86, which metal fans know to be a crucial year that saw Rain and Blood and Master of Puppets and Peace Cells and, I mean, just... 86 was the year if you had to pick a year for that specific style of music. But Cryptic Slaughter was more in that kind of crossover, punk, hardcore, DRI. Like, what was that scene like at that time? And how did you find yourself playing in that type of band as opposed to any other type of band that you might have ended up in? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, 86 was the jam and the, and the years leading up to that, you know, for sure. I mean, if you consider, you know, that, it took it took Slayer and Metallica a few records, right, to get to the to into into that '86 peak. Yeah. So, um, you know, we were just starting out then. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it was mutual friends, right? Like I was, of course, in garage bands and had my own bands and stuff. You know, at a very early age. 
And then it was a, a mutual friend, this guy named Chris, knew Scott, that was the drummer in Cryptic, and knew me because we went, we went to school together. And, uh, and at the time, Cryptic was a three-piece, and Bill sang and played bass, but he didn't want to play bass anymore. He just wanted to be the singer. So they were looking for a bass player, and Chris connected the dots. And, you know, we all met up and like each other and, and, uh, and it was cool. And, and, um, I just kind of, kind of blended in. And then, um, and then shortly thereafter, we got that record deal with Metal Blade and, um, and, you know, went, I mean, it's a little bit of a blur. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we, we did like weird shows and like VFW halls with no PA and backyard parties and, stuff but it was a different time then you know i mean it was pre-internet pre-cell phone um you know so it was all tape trading and and really underground i mean it was really underground i mean if you figure that master of puppets and rain and blood were about as mainstream as you got i mean short of the iron maidens and judas priests right but like you know uh, but slayer and metallica were really underground bands still at that time absolutely um you know and uh and stuff so um so but it was uh and they were just then emerging you know before that you could still slayer was kind of still technically a local band you know you could still go to the country club and see them play yeah, yeah. you know um so um but man it was it was a great time i mean it was it was so, so the scene was so full of life and if you figure too we're in southern california the band itself was in santa monica but i was in venice which was only you know a few miles down the road but in in my world was the you know the beowulf suicidal no mercy welcome to venice thing was going on while in in excel and stuff and then and then cryptic slaughter we get to deal with metal blade but then we're on the same label as corrosion of conformity and dri and the mentors and you know raw power and beyond possession like it was it, so that kind of opened up opened us up to a whole other thing that wasn't so localized, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to understand, especially pre-internet uh, and pre, let alone infiltration of the mainstream of, of heavier music, scenes were so regional and so localized. Whereas I found, you know, I've lived in Cal Southern California for twenty, almost twenty years now, and nineteen nineteen years, and I find that people will assume that Pomona and Santa Cruz and San Diego are all basically the same place. If when you're talking to someone who's not from California, and doesn't live here. Whereas that, that setting that you described, I mean, for me growing up in Indianapolis, which you could really get from one side of town to the other in 20 minutes, but I grew up on the South side and some other kids I met in the music scene were from the North side. And it was like they're from another planet, you know? Mm -hmm. and some, some people that I'm still friends with now, uh, we have a group chat, like, you know, six of us that grew up in Indiana together and we're all spread out all over the country now. And the two of us that are from the South side, they st the, the other guys still make jokes. It's all in fun, but they still tease us about being from the South side because it was like <laughs> right. working class, like, you know, crappy, low income area. And the North side was like the more well-to-do, which well-to-do in those days in that area, <laughs> not what yeah. we associate today with wealthy people, but, sure. but yeah, it, it was, it was very factional. Some of those scenes too, where you could have like a vibrant local scene in what's essentially a small town of bands that all know each other and play those backyard parties and VFW halls together. and don't even really get outside of that bubble much. So for Cryptic Slaughter to be on Metal Blade, an international label as small as it was at the time, I mean that had to be mind blowing as a teenager, right? I mean you're like you're on a, you're on a record label, like <laughs> being on yeah, a record label I mean, at all is crazy. Yeah, I mean it really is. I mean if you, I mean to look back on it in hindsight, right? Like at the time we were just kind of going for it and. I, I mean, I don't, I have no recollection of us like shopping for a record deal or hoping for a record deal. It was kind of one of those things that just felt like the natural progression of what was next. And, um, 
it, and, but yeah, I mean, like we had, you know, like I said, we had COC and DRI and that stuff with us on metal blade. Um, and then, you know, the, I don't even remember where all the excels and, 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 and stuff suicidal. I don't remember where they were in 1986. Um, but you know, they, had, I think their first record was on frontier, but like they, they had gone past that and, um, Excel, I don't remember where, where they were at that time. Um, but then like, you know, there was like the accused that we did a lot of shows with. And then there was a, a label called new Renaissance I that, that was, yeah. that, that was started by, wasn't, that, wasn't that like artillery and whiplash and those kind of bands were they on new Renaissance? I remember it had like a really creepy weird logo like it always it, yeah. seemed, it seemed even more underground than than like you know oh yeah i mean the the stuff. girl that the girl that ran it was a girl that sang in this band called detente and uh <clears throat> i mean wow that's going back and um and man I'm, I'm trying to think of you know sort of the other stuff but there was combat records at the time i mean there was you know there was there was definitely an underground i mean it was a real scene we're talking about yeah. fanzines and labels and tape trading and you know, I mean, if you're talking about a scene, like the underground metal scene was hot, man. Like, yeah. you know, it was, it was, it was, I, really, I and then in 1980. I was, I was yeah. right about Artillery uh, and At War. That was the other band I was thinking of. When I, At I War, that was a good record. We're yeah. Vermont, Artillery, Prong, Sepultura, Flotsam and Jetsam. I don't remember Flotsam and Jetsam being on New Renaissance, but you know what? That might have been, maybe they just did like their UK, Europe stuff or something. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, yeah, there was, yeah, was a lot and, happening. Yeah. And Wehrmacht, we did we did a lot of we did most of our shows with Wehrmacht. And oh yeah. Most of our touring with them, and and they were yeah they were you know on New Renaissance, you know, and they and they were our peers and stuff. So, um, I think I think the accused might have been on Combat. Now that I think about it, I think so. Um, yeah, but uh, but yeah, I mean you know so there was a lot of stuff going on, but but in hindsight when you, when you think about a band putting out a 12 inch record, like getting a record deal and putting, and that label putting out a 12 inch record, it wasn't something that a band could very easily do. Like, right. whereas now a band could record a record on their laptop and upload it to Spotify and right. for the weekend, you yeah. know, whereas that it wasn't something to where you could go into, you could easily go into a studio, record a record. Yeah take those masters and call a call a, a vinyl pressing plant and, and and make up a record and distribute it to stores. I mean, a you graphic, could graphic designer to like hand illustrate your, like, yeah. you know, cut and paste your logo and put, you yeah. know, I mean, you could, and there was plenty of, of DIY going on at that time, but it was almost kind of like a sort of a badge of honor. If you were a band that could get a record deal enough, cause you, you figure there's so much, time effort money and energy that goes into a label putting out a piece of vinyl and distributing it to record stores sure. and ma and mail order and stuff to where it sort of separated i guess so, you know some of the the good from the bad not to say that we were a good band but that that you know but think think of you know think of all the bands that never got a chance you know that never yeah. kind of really broke out enough i mean we you know we did a lot of shows with a lot of bands that you know never got a you know a deal you know so, um, but it was just, a, it was just a completely different time, man, you know, very different. And do you find that some of those relationships from all the way back then, I mean, obviously it's like any, you know, it's like people you went to high school with in some sense, but also given the interconnectedness of underground music scenes and that particular scene, are there, are, were there some lifelong relationships and friendships that you forged back then that weave in and out of your life since then? Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I think of just this, I mean, you know, Brian Slagle, you know, the guy that owns Metal Blade Records and William Howell, the guy that was our A&R guy at the time. I mean, you know, I'm still way friendly yeah. with those guys, you yeah. know, um, and, uh, and, st Amazing. you know, Brian, I, I talked to you and I've interviewed him for my podcast and, you know, he donates to my cat charities and like, mm -hmm. You know, and we're so yeah. I mean, we're we're still close, and that was you know whatever, dude, eighty six. Yeah. You know? So um, but yeah, I mean, it's you know so, some people stuck around, and some people faded off into the distance and did whatever you know they ended up doing. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's crazy when you think of that, that this, that at an 86 in no way did you think that metal was going to be a business, right? That it was right. for so many people, when you think of the people that started labels or were in bands or whatever, it was just totally born out of organic passion Absolutely. for the music. Like in no way did, you know, Slagle think he was going to be a heavy metal mogul when he, when he yeah. started it. I didn't, he I didn't, just I said, didn't start fanzines thinking that I was going to have, you know, it was going to be sold at the grocery store. <laughs> no. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a really great, it was a really great time you know, that we, that was in that, you know, that, that era, man, was great. What do you remember about, um, I know you said it's all kind of a blur and we don't have to get too into the weeds on it because you got a lot of other records to talk about, but uh, Convicted in particular being your first real record in your career. What do you remember about that recording experience about actually making yeah. it, actually, you know, having someone record you for the first time and that whole thing? Yeah. I mean, I, Professionally. I, we we were like 15 or 16 years old at the time in high school. I'm pretty sure I didn't even drive. I'm pretty sure I, no, actually I know I didn't drive because we skateboarded everywhere. Um, and uh, so I think someone's parents dropped us off at the studio. I mean, we recorded the, we recorded the bulk of the record in a weekend and it was a place called track record and it was on, Melrose further down Melrose past like Astro Burger. You know what I'm saying? Like, you yeah. know, that yeah. kind of era by, but whatever NBC studios over there. Paramount's over there. Paramount. Yep. 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 It was, it was over by there. It's a furniture store now, but it was like this small studio. Um, it had a, you know, a, a live room, it had a drum room. And then the control room, like it was, it was like four little rooms that they did. And it was, it was like, you know, it was a cool little studio. And um, uh, Bill Matoyer yeah. tracked and pr produced it. And he had done, you know, the Slayer records and he'd done a lot of, I think he might've been a staff guy or, or you know, on Metal Blade or part owner if or you, something. If, if you were, a th if you were a thrash metal person in the mid to late eighties, a kid like myself, and you were reading the liner notes inside your cassettes, <laughs> like I was, you knew that name. You saw that yeah. name. Yeah. A lot of records. Totally. Kind of like, like a Don Fury or something in the hardcore world. Yeah. And we just went in and did it. I mean, like I said, it was like we, you know, I think our budget was $2,400 or something. <laughs> Which probably you know? sounded like a million dollars. Yeah. I mean, in 1986. Yeah. Yeah. Can we get it done? You know, I mean, I think that was, I don't even think any of us were in control of the budget or anything. It's kind of sure. just like, this is how much it cost. Um, and, uh, we, we, we just went in there and, and banged it out in a weekend. I remember Caton from Hyrax coming down at some point and, and then I don't remember what happened if, if it turns out like the record was, wasn't long enough or something, but we had to go in and write two more songs. And we did. So then there was another session that we went in and, and we recorded two additional tracks. And if you listen to the record, there's two songs that definitely don't sound like the rest of the record. And those are those two songs. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that was basically, that was basically it. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was very exciting, but it was so, it was so quick, you know, it happened so quick. Like I said, it was in a, it was in a weekend and, um, you know, I, don't, I mean, I think we recorded all at once. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think we did overdubs. Like yeah. it was, it, it was wait, pretty much. Did you guys record live in a room together? Like the whole day? Yeah. I mean, there was, there was separation. Like Scott was in one room with sliding glass windows and there was a vocal booth in the back. And uh, I don't remember, but yeah, I mean, it was basically like. Drummer counts before. you in and you're just going like you're at band practice. Yeah, yeah. We were basically just recording, you know, the rehearsal really i mean it was yeah. kind of like how it went i one thing i remember it was funny like so the drum kit was a drum kit or maybe it was just the snare drum was something that bill that that bill matoyer had previously used or used maybe because it was tuned or, or, or i don't remember why we use it but i remember the snare drum specifically had written in sharpie 
don't forget to pick up your drumstick because I guess the band that had used it before, every time he would hit the snare, instead of snapping back, he would leave the dr drumstick on the snare so it would pick up like on the microphone consistently or whatever. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, that is a very small memory of, of Yeah, that. that's so great. That's, uh, that's such a, you know, it's such a different era than like, oh, let's get our, our samples out of this drum program and do our MIDI drums and <laughs> <laughs> no. thinking, thinking you've got to have a, a, a note and, you know, yeah, primitive analog uh, Sharpie. Um, yeah. So you know this story, of course, but uh, so I'm a kid in Indiana and I'm getting into the local thrash metal punk hardcore scene and I'm reading magazines and getting into all those bands and stuff. And I first discovered Cryptic Slaughter via there was a band in my hometown called Radiation Sickness, who was very similar in terms of imagery and, and lyrical themes and sound to Cryptic Slaughter. And they covered Money Talks. And so oh, I, cool. I, I saw them in literally a basement, a basement party. Mm. I was there with my friends and we, we, were, we were young. I definitely wasn't driving because I have a vivid memory. One of those like still makes you embarrassed kind of memories my stepmom came to pick me and my two friends up and like the older brother of the kid whose house it was, who was like a jock, like literally like an eighties movie jock with like the letterman jacket and stuff. He comes down the stairs in the basement and in front of everybody, he goes, Ryan Downey, your mommy's <laughs> outside. Your mommy's here. You know, it's just like, you know, amazing. My, my friends, you know, we got like leather jackets and spikes and <laughs> we're, just, <laughs> we're like 14, you know, so we're, just, but that That's was, uh, but yeah, but they, when they would play that song, they would say, this is a, from a band called Cryptic Slaughter. So I went and got the Cryptic Slaughter cassette from Karma Records on the South side of Indianapolis. And that was my first uh, exposure to the band was, was Money Talks. And that was 87, right? That record. Yeah, so yeah, because we put out like year after year, right? Like Kiss. Yeah, it was, it was, it was for me, it was convicted 10th grade, Money Talks 11th grade, Stream of Consciousness 12th grade. Like it was bam, 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 you know? Um, yeah. Because I mean, you got to figure it's like, I mean, we toured a little bit and, or had, you know, we did shows and stuff, but you got to figure the most things that we did was sort of write and record because we would, we would literally go to school. Then go over to Scott's house and write music and re and and jam and rehearse and jam, hang out, watch Bones Brigade for the millionth time, and like and listen to punk rock and heavy metal records and like that's that was that was our life, you know. Um, so we were cranking out stuff all the time because we weren't that was all that was all we did, you know, after school. Yeah. Um, and uh yeah so i mean that that's we we were yeah we were cranking those out so yeah money talks was uh that was it was that was a step up um at that point um we our budget had increased um we did we recorded that thing in a bunch of different studios like i think we recorded the drums in one studio and then there was like again by the burbank airport and then we recorded i don't even remember where we recorded the rest of it but we kind of bounced around it was almost like recording a real record um which you know technically speaking it is a considerably much better record um and uh i think that you know the songwriting you know got you know matured i mean we just kind of more matured as as a band and um and you know metal blade and bill kind of brought their a game to the situation as well so collectively it was a it was a i think a much just a much more mature product you know yeah. at, at, at that point and um and stuff and and we were like i remember dude we were like you know we were teenagers and stuff and we were total like bratty kids and i remember bill matoyer had to sit us down and goes look dude like you guys gotta chill the fuck out like you like you guys are out of control like i i want to help you but you guys gotta like you guys gotta be cool and um and so we chilled out and stopped you know harassing him and making you know we were just we were just out of control but like in a fun way but he was just yeah. over it <laughs> you <know? laughs> you were, shenanigans you were shenanigans yeah 
It's all right. Grown-ups aren't so into the shenanigans. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah, Money Talks is the record of the three for me, but I also wonder, you know, there's always that time, place, and circumstance thing of records like when you discovered them and all that. And I think because that was the one that I came in on, that's the one mm. that now if somebody's like, oh, what the, I've never heard Cryptic Slaughter. Like, that's the record I'll pull up and be like. That's the record. This out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, if I'm at a show and some dude comes up to me, he sings Money Talks to me to my yeah. face. Like, yeah. that's the... That's the song, you know. If we didn't know each other, I'd be that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that'd, be, that'd be me. I'd, I'd be him. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, then the la- so then the last record, um, tell me, you know, briefly how that came together. And then I want to get into the 90s because this, this closes out the 80s. Yeah, I mean, the, it's one of that, that third record was one of those, was one of those things that, you know, in hindsight, you kind of wish you could have done it all over. I do think that the songwriting was progressing and, you know, cause the, the thing about, the thing about cryptic slaughter that I will say is that compared to our, like, we didn't wake up one day and go, you know, what would be cool is if we played faster than everybody else. It wasn't like we planned on doing that. It was just kind of like, like our sound was this sort of mashup of what the four of us brought to the table um, in terms of influences, in terms of how we interpreted that and how it came, how everyone put their own two cents, like meaning that Les's guitar tone wasn't a typical guitar tone. Yeah. You know, Bill, Bill's delivery wasn't typical. Scott playing super fast, you know, wasn't, wasn't typical. And even though I, when you think of in terms of a lot, a lot of our peers, I think had, maybe a little bit higher skill level than us and probably because they were older than us sure. you know, had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't necessarily think we were the most skilled band Our albums maybe didn't sound the best, but for some reason it was a, it was a band that kind of really resonated with a lot of people more than, more than others for whatever reason. Um, and, and I, I think maybe part of it is just because we were an original, a very original sound coming from the, you know an original place you know or yeah. an organic place maybe um and uh but so the third record was a thing where we took the dough we thought that we could make the record ourselves. Mm. Uh, we 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 took a, a chunk of the money and bought new gear um, we just did stupid stuff like we 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 went to it we didn't have a producer we used this engineer he didn't know what he was doing traditions um, that continue to this day by the way <laughs> yeah fans, you know fans at all and, levels and make the same right. mistake that you're describing yeah like yeah. so the record doesn't sound great i don't know that the, the execution was was great um maybe if you look through the fog maybe it is somewhere the interesting thing about that record is as much as as much as like I'm maybe overly critical, I think the other band guys are overly critical on that record too, and maybe a little regretful um, of it, is that the critics really loved that record. And um, like, I remember getting like, like a, it was like a 90%, like in Metal Hammer or something. And they were, and they were talking about how the sound was so innovative. It, you know what I mean? It was yeah. almost like, it was almost like Saint Anger on accident, like, but but but, to, but where we were like, all, oh wow, that's a, that's an interesting perspective because we all kind of hated it. But and and then and then to fast forward years and years to the refused Shape of Punk to Come cites that record as an influence because it broke the mold or whatever, and I was like, yeah. it blew my mind that because you knew that, that more of an accidental brilliance <laughs> than an for intentional sure. brilliance, which is for sure for so many of those records uh that are so important over the years i think that's the story of just about all of them you know yeah with few yeah. exceptions was the mindset like we're gonna change everything by doing this thing this way um, yeah. I'm sure there's many that have set out to do to do that and failed <laughs> that we've never heard of, you know. <laughs> but sure. yeah, I think there's a lot yeah. of accidental brilliance, and there's you know there's 
some cliches that are true, like necessity is the mother of invention. And, uh, you know, that whole, like, the limited resources producing, like, some of the more powerful stuff, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, when, yeah, I mean, Somebody who doesn't know how to record is going to record differently than someone who does and may bumble their way into (laughs) making a a unique sounding record without even necessarily trying to. Right. And there is this replicate a normal record. It sounds like the strengths were the weaknesses, you know, which is kind of, kind of wacky, you know, to think about in hindsight, but yeah, that's how it all ended up. And then we put out that record. Uh, That was 1988. We graduate. Well, some, yeah. I mean, Less it was already in college, but the rest of us graduated. We got in a van, literally the next day, got in a van and went on tour. And that lasted, I think, like three or four weeks. And then we came home and broke up and everybody went their own direction. And I moved to Hollywood to pursue the rock and roll dream. And that was, that chapter was closed. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So uh, probably the one of the lesser known, but I think certainly important in your life story uh, would be the record that you did in the 90s, 94. Yeah. Um, yeah. T- tell me about that band and about how, because I mean, because that was one of those bands in my recollection that was in that mix of, of almost made it. You know, like there's so many bands that were like, had a lot of the the stars aligning in just the right ways. And then maybe one or two things didn't happen that could have, and the band never got that big. It's interesting because... Is that fair to put it in in that category of one of those bands? It was like they should have, but they didn't. Yeah. Yeah, but the the 90s band... um, Drown. I didn't say the name of the band yet. Drown, Drown. yeah. Yeah. the, the, The dots connected from the 80s era in that I got in that situation from Todd, the drummer, who I knew from the eighties, cause he was from the Bay area and he played drums in a band called Bloodbath. And we did a show with them up in Portland. It was like Bloodbath and us and Fairmont and I don't remember who else or whatever, but that's how I knew him. So he moved at some point, he moved down to Hollywood and then I moved in, into Hollywood and we somehow connected and he was doing this thing and and then i ended up in the thing that he was doing that eventually became drown um and uh and it was it was you know it was a process for sure but you know the 90s like the 80s were just a completely different time Mm -hmm. um you know you had so many there there was a lot there was a lot of stuff going on and there was a lot of really kick-ass stuff coming out of la like tool and rage against the machine and you know, there was a lot of really green was, jello. It, green jello, <laughs> yeah. That time. But, but the cool thing about the '90s is that that you know bands were so good, yet they were all so different. It was all so eclectic, right? Like if you like the you know the Jane's Addictions and, you, you, and all that, that, that was. That's what Lollapalooza was. That's why you could go to Lollapalooza yeah. and see Jane's and Ice Cube. You know, like yeah. it was everything was that whole broad brush of alternative that was bandied about in that time could be anything from the Smashing Pumpkins to Rollins Band to Mm -hmm. Fugazi to, you know, it was like this stuff that, you know, Bratmobile, Bikini Kill, um, so many different bands that, that looked and sounded so much different from one another. And just that whole like alternative rock phrase in the nineties to me was, was, one that was like this is rock and it's not hair metal and it's not death metal speed metal you know it, it's just yeah. other it's alternative so it was like everything you know a lot of those bands didn't have anything in common other than not having anything in common if that makes sense no i mean the thing the thing about drown is that it was it was another one of those mashups where different guys bringing in their own influences and sensibilities into it and the end result was sort of this mashup of all this stuff but it was like on one hand it was bringing in things like the Rollins band and Neurosis and then on the other hand it was bringing in Skinny Puppy and Ministry and 
mm-hmm. KMFDM. Like it was so, sort of those things that were mashing it up. Plus, you know, plus our, our you know, our, our histories and, and everything else that was going into it. But it, it was all that, that that sort of culminated into into what Drown, you know, eventually became. You know, we were, it was, there was a lot, of, in LA, there was a lot of record labels and there was a lot of bands. And there was a, a label specifically A&M and A&M had all these studios there, you know, across mm-hmm. from beyond you know, sunset and uh, whatever, La Brea. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they had a demo studio in on their studio lot and they would bring in bands. And there was a guy named Pierre. He was the A&R guy. And he would is that, scoop is in all Jim Henson studio. Yep. It's, it's Jim Henson yeah. now. Yeah. But yeah. that was A&M records and those were the A&M studios. Um, and this guy, Pierre, he was the a and guy there and he would be scooping up all these local LA bands and putting them in the studio and just really trying to develop them, getting them to write and record. And, and he'd bring you in multiple times and like, ah, we got to get something more like this. And he'd put you back to in the rehearsal room to write some more stuff. And then when you had more stuff, he'd put you back in the studio and, um, and man, we got a bunch of cool stuff out of those sessions. But at the end of the day, we never got a deal with A&M, but we got a, a bunch of killer music. Um, so, you know, fast forward a, a few, I don't know, months or a year or whatever, what have you. Um, we, do, we do a demo with a guy named, uh, uh, um, oh, why am I forgetting his name? Um, it'll come to me. Um, Bill, Bill Kennedy. And he, he had worked on some stuff with Nine Inch Nails and, and, uh, and he did a demo for us. He had just done the demo for Filter, Richard Patrick. Oh, sure. That got, yeah. got, that got him his deal. Um, Bro- and brother, so we went in. The brother of the Terminator, Robert Patrick. Yeah, yes. And, and we went into this studio off, over by the Sportsman's Lodge in Sherman Oaks that's now like a cleaners or something mm-hmm. and uh and we went in there and recorded this crazy demo and it, it ended up getting in the hands of michael olago who you know we know right yeah um, and who signed you know metallica and white zombie and stuff um and he there's, got it he michael, really michael olago i should say has a book out right now there's a documentary about him called who the f is yeah. that guy that i think you can still watch on netflix yeah, he's yep. the guy. Who's, he signed Metallica to Elektra. He signed the the Misfits 2.0, the Misfits without Danzig to Geffen. Yep. Later in the '90s, uh, he's been involved yep. in a lot of uh, Nina Simone, a lot of big careers. Uh, yeah. He started out doing a fanzine and a fan club for the Dead Boys. It was a really cool yep. history. And much yes, like last week, cool. you can hear him on my Metallica podcast, Speak and Destroy, <laughs> available now yeah. wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, Yes, continue. So Michael Olago, and, so you and him. He, he got it, and he really loved the energy of it. I'm sure I'm missing a lot of pieces, but to summarize, he flew to L.A., saw us play, loved it, and then he gave us a record deal. Um, and he signed us to Elektra you know, Records. And, um, uh, at, and then he like a lot of stuff happened really fast at that point. So we got signed to Electra. He put us with the Piranha brothers for management, which was Walter O'Brien and Andy Gould. And they collectively managed oh. Pantera, White Zombie, yeah. Prong. I didn't know Obsessed. that. I didn't know those guys yeah. managed you. Okay. Yeah. And um, no, all the puzzle pieces are starting to assemble in yep. my brain a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and Dave Ogilvy and Bill Kennedy, made the record Dave Ogilvy did a bunch of stuff with skinny puppy. Um, and then, you know, Bill had done our demo and so we, we put them together to do this. And we made this record that probably cost $350,000 at A&M. And, uh, you know, cause that's how, that's, that's how yeah. you made records. That's, about, that's like, yeah. And you had to, and yeah. that was probably like a cheap record. Like, yeah, well, this is totally. a new band. Let's not get crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I think we spent a month at A&M that's, you know, $2,500 a day. It's yeah. just crazy, yeah. you know? And, uh, and, and so, so we, so we had those guys, so we thought that we were the shit, right? Cause we were like, first time by Michael Olago, sure. we're on a major, we have 
Pantera when I said all the stars white. were aligning, I didn't even know that you had the you had the Pantera white zombie managers and yeah, you know, Michael and, and Lago so, was your Antar guy and yeah. right. And we had and we had you know Skinny Puppy dude you know producing it. We the record sounded gnarly and uh, dude, we and thought Electra, we were the shit. Electra was Metallica and was it Motley Crue at that point? Were they on Electra? And Caius, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, so it was. And, yeah, that was all you were about to blow. <laughs> yeah, there was a bunch of there was a bunch of crap on there too, but um, and uh, nobody ever remembers and, all the crap. Nobody remembers the no, hundred bands. Yeah, no, yeah. but uh, and and uh, and I don't know, man. I th- I think at some point because there was so much arty farty music going on in the nineties, I think we sort of lost sight of the. The, the more kind of simpler stuff that we had done that got us there. And we really went maybe a little too far right into the six minute song land yeah. of somewhere between skinny puppy and tool and Rollins band. And we just got, I feel like if I'm looking at it in hindsight of maybe what we did wrong is I think we just got, we just lost sight of it and got too arty farty and, and uh, we're, we're trying to maybe be a little too uh, too progressive for our own for what the world needed at the time. Um, and uh, and anyway, so we had all this cool stuff, and we put the record out, and it was pretty much a dud. And then we did a couple of tours, and and then then we got dropped, and that was the end of it. <laughs> and it's interesting so. to even think about what's a dud by 1994 standards. You yeah. Know, well, probably, it was I easy. Mean, you know, yeah. Oh, as, was we, easy. as we're taping this, a record just came out that was the number one rock record and the number one alternative rock record, and it sold 5,000 copies to, to yeah. place them, So <laughs> I, mean, had, I don't even know that we sold 5,000 copies, to be honest. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, but that's one of those things to where yeah, there's a lot to be taken away from that. We could do a whole nother you know, episode sure. on, I mean, there was a lot to, to learn in there, but the, but the simple thing was, is, you know, we, we were, we were one of those nineties bands, you know, we got that major deal. We had that major, yeah, you know, because our story isn't unique to us. I mean, dude, there's 200 you know, bands that could have this exact same story for, you know, and it's like, we, we did it. We made a big record. We spent a bunch of money. We put it out there and no one got it and it didn't stick. And we tried it and, and, it, it it couldn't it couldn't scale right it couldn't sustain yeah. itself so it imploded it imploded in on itself and then we all went our separate ways you know the, the singer guy went to continue to try and do the band and joe went on to do uh you know work in movies and score movies and now he's like one of the biggest horror movie score guys in the world wow. and uh and um and then here's me you know still yeah. trying to make it happen yeah <laughs> You know, it, it, it's fascinating too. And yeah, and that could be a whole other episode of something else is talking about all those stories. You know, my older brother was in a band that was, uh, they were called Electric Tees. And it was like a, a local hair metal band. We had a little local hair metal scene. And, um, you know, as the name would imply, it was very Hanoi Rocks, early Motley Crue, like that kind of stuff in the 80s. And then at some point after my brother left, in the early nineties, the band changed their name to the beautiful authentic zoo gods. And the singer had a really kind of Perry Farrell, like Jane's addiction, kind of voice. And they were an alternative rock band, like every band we just described. And they were from mm-hmm. Indianapolis and they were big locally. Well, they got a deal with um, an imprint at Capitol records, which was in a grunge signing spree. And the, the word was, I remember the story Capital was setting up an imprint to be their grunge imprint. And they took these guys out of Indiana, of gave them money, put them in the studio. Very similar story too, where I think they got in there and, and got arty farty and avant-garde and pushed the boundaries of the weird trippiness. I mean, you know, their band name alone, beautiful, authentic zoo gods was like already, you know, not necessarily destined to be rolling off the tongue, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. yeah, they, um, they made, demos and made their record and then they got dropped before the record even came out 
Yeah, that wasn't uncommon either. Just shelved. Yeah, and then the yeah. whole imprint the capital was going to do for grunge folded. The imprint didn't even launch. They got yeah. dropped. You know, the band obviously is defeated and back in Indiana and this guy quits and then this guy quits and some of those songs eventually came out as an EP on Cleopatra. But I think Wow. The, I think the band was even broken up when that when that came out. But uh yeah, and it was a similar thing where it was like some of those guys tried to do it and other, you know, other bands came and went and then like this guy owns a restaurant and this guy, you know, the lead guitar player is one of the best guitar players I've ever seen is like, you know, giving guitar lessons in Indiana, like probably, sure. you know, like, yeah. yeah. I mean, how many of those stories are there like drown of getting up to a certain point and, but then that's it. But feeling yeah. on that whole ride, like, here we go, here we go, here we go. We're going up the roller coaster. It's going to be our moment. And then it just, that's just, you know, just doesn't mm-hmm. happen. No. So, um, this leads us very nicely into, you know, unfortunately, it, it, you know, trying to keep it focused on your discography versus your life story. So I don't take up your yeah. entire, entire week. Uh, but this, bring, this then brings us up to the zombie period. And yep. I, didn't, I didn't realize that uh, the white zombie managers managed Drown. So was that, was, did that play a part then? And, you know, yes. this, band, this other band we work with, this guy just quit. He's great. Uh, white Zombie's breaking up. Rob's going solo. He, he's putting together a band. That yeah, that's very, that's very exactly. Part? Yeah, that's very exactly how that happened. So when we were in Drown, um, we did a few tours. Um, and one of, one of them, it was only three shows, but it was three shows opening for White Zombie. So hmm. there's that connection. And then the tour tour that we did that was like, you know, whatever, eight or nine weeks long, that was prong, clutch, drown. And, um, and that's how I know the clutch guys is from there. And they were, they were just about to put out their second record. Um, and then prong was on their big record, which was, um, uh, cleansing. Oh, okay. And I was thinking right. Cleansing. No, cleansing was their big yeah. record. I'd snap your fingers, snap your. Okay, neck. that was on cleansing. Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, and and so and those guys managed Prong as well. So that's how we got that tour. Yeah. So then when you figure, here's me, drown is over, I'm out. What's the very next thing I do? Those guys call me up. They go, hey, Prong needs a bass player. Cool, bam. So there, there's yeah. that. So I do. Does this also from, explain the hot second that you were in Danzig because Tommy Victor was playing from Prong was in Danzig. Uh, but he hadn't at that point. Oh, that's right. But you weren't, but that wasn't yeah. at the same time. Anyway, right. it's all, it's all an interwoven web of very, it is one degree it is. of separation so, from, yeah. so anyway. I, I get, I get the, I get the prong gig. I do that for a minute. That thing implodes on itself as a very much a similar 90s story where they get the rug pulled out from underneath them yeah. and it just caves in, bam, that's over. Um, and then yes. And then, so here's me with this connection with this management company and Rob's putting a band together and he needs some dudes and I'm on the Rolodex, right? Like I'm, yeah. Oh man, remember that dude, he was in that band and you guys did shows and that, and he's like, Oh yeah, whatever. Um, and then that's, that's how that happened. And, and literally it was Rob or a- Andy Gould, the manager, one of them, it had to have been Andy calls me up and is like, Hey, like, Rob needs a bass player. Can you meet him at uh, Mel's diner at like noon <laughs> or whatever, yeah, you know? Yeah. And then, so I met him at Mel's diner at noon. I sat Amazing. down with, yeah, I sat down with Rob and Rob's like, yeah, man, like I'm doing the solo thing. I'm up at the studio now. Um, we're getting close to finishing it and uh, we're, I'm going to tour. And I just want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're on, you know, that you're, that you're cool, like you're on. He's like, I know you can play. You played in other bands. Um, you've toured with my band, um, but like, I just want to make sure that you know you get it right. That you get this is the Rob Zombie band, and you just you know you'll you'll just be a good team player. And I yeah. was like, hell yeah, man, fuck yeah. I'm like, I'm you know what I'm doing right now, dude. I'm working at a used clothing store. Like I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm I I am I am a fucking team I player. No ball. problem. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Th- no problem. And I was like, oh are we going to play white zombie songs? And he goes, yeah. And I go, 
I'm totally in. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> great. Yeah. Use clothing store to plain thunder kiss. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, I think I'll take no, it. Yeah. No problem. Um, and so he's like, okay, cool. So we get in the car, we drive up to the studio, literally from Mel's diner to Scott Humphrey's studio. Wow. Um, and, and I, we walk in and he's like, and they were working on that song Dragula at the time. Wow. And, and, and Scott's like, yeah, do you just grab that bass? And he's like, it's in C sharp. I, it, this is how it went down. He goes, grab that bass over there. Uh, it's in C sharp and uh cool you ready and he just hit record and i and i had never heard it before and what and i just whatever <laughs> kind of threw stuff some stuff down and and then so we did a pass and he goes yeah yeah cool whatever he's like well let's do it again and this time don't suck or whatever <laughs> and like <laughs> and so so you know i think we did a couple of passes and they chopped it up and did whatever they did with it and, yeah. and then and then that was and then that was it that was my audition really and um and and then I think shortly thereafter, um I was able to quit my used clothing job and and uh, uh and um that was jet rag on on uh right uh, La Brea there that was where I was working at the time and uh and then that was it and then we went on tour and then at the time you got to think that the 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 label and and the management and everything thought that this was a temporary thing so they were very vocal about just so you guys know, like this is going to be all fun and, you know, fun and games for you guys, but um, you're going to be going back to your used clothing job in you know right. a few months. Once, once Rob gets us out of the system and uh, we're like, yeah, cool. But I mean, just the opportunity sure. to, to do it, you know what I mean? Like it's, this is going to be my biggest thing that I've ever done. So I don't care how long it lasts. I'm stoked just to be given the opportunity. Um, and, and then the record came out and the dude, it fucking exploded. You know, and it, that Dragula song was huge. Um, and somewhere in the midst of that tour, I mean, he broke up White Zombie. Like he had a conference call and was like, I'm out. It's over. And then he told us, he's if like, yeah, we're mad. And you're like, why would I deal with this? Bands are complicated, you know? Yeah, would, totally. You know, I'm out yeah, here and, uh, with my new girlfriend. We get along great. It's the honeymoon. Mm -hmm. this marriage and, uh, sucks <laughs> totally that's what happened. And i think yeah. that's pretty much what it was and yeah. and uh and 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 then that was it and then we it kept on the train kept the rolling <laughs> yeah know? and that's and that's, so and that's what it was yeah yeah um you know one of those things and you and i have spoken about this before in our friendship but one of the things i really appreciate about that era in particular is i love that that uh, and there's no disrespect to anybody who's been in the band since or currently because Rob has certainly like Ozzy has had amazing players in and out of his band, but that initial, that first lineup of the solo band, as much as it was Rob Zombie's solo and very much he's the marquee, there was something like the band photos, the videos, seeing you guys live. It, it looked like a gang. Like you were all like, it was like, before he was even making movies, it was like a Rob Zombie movie was on the stage between the production, just the the look and feel that all of you guys had. It just that thing that happens in 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 a lot of bands that I think is maybe less contrived than people realize. When you see a band, and you're like, "That's a band!" Like those people yeah. are in a band together. Um, yeah, you know, there's some bands where they get out a piece of paper and they're like, "Here's what we're gonna wear," and there's nothing wrong with that either. But what was I, I, I guess if you could tell me from your perspective, having lived it, what sort of the origin of that was like, how, like how do you end up with a band that looks like the Rob Zombie band and performs like yeah. the Rob Zombie, you know what I mean? Like it just, it really had a cohesiveness to it. that I thought was really cool. Yeah. I mean, he picked the right dudes and, and I think, and you know, that was, that was the interpretation of what he meant by being a team player. Mm. Um, and and certainly we were, but we, it wasn't like he had to force us. I mean, it was kind of like we were just inherently those dudes anyway. Right. Um, it was funny. I remember reading a review from like an Ozfest from somewhere and it, and it was like Rob Zombie and his band of clones. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing though, is it wasn't, it, it just was like, right. I know what they mean, but it was like, it, it, it felt like a band. I don't know. It was cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, on one hand, 
from an outside observation, like I'm not saying that Rob said this, but from a fan of white zombie kind of seeing it over the years, yeah. whereas I feel like those dudes started to lose the plot a little bit mm-hmm. where is like initially, you know, you would see white zombie. You're like, I, this is like the craziest looking and sounding band I have ever seen. Right. And then I remember you, you go a few years into it and I'm like, is the dude at sound check because he's wearing like a wife beater and like Adidas pants, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and as a fan, as like a fan. I was offended. I was, I was offended by that. So, you know, I was like, I know what he, I know what he wants because it's what I want to see. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. And that's where it's less contrived than people might think, you know, in that, yeah. in that sense. And that, that's when I think it's, it's cool and it works. And I mean, Hey, and then, you know, there's something like the misfits where, um you know the brothers right like jerry and doyle they don't danzig walks around looking like danzig all day long is my understanding those two guys don't look like jerry only and doyle in their everyday lives but then they get up and do the misfits thing and i think that's cool i mean Mm. i i I would be super bummed if i went to see the misfits and they were in their sweatpants and baseball hats and you know no but i I remember i remember in in the 90s uh the first time the reunion misfits came through town one of my friends telling me like, I saw the Misfits at Soundtrack. They look like Springsteen roadies. <laughs> For some reason, I always, it was just such a random call, but I always think about Springsteen roadies whenever I see them in their, That's hilarious. In their secret identity. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that was Hellbilly. Um, so Sinister Urge came a few years later. At this point, yep. you've, you're, you've been in the band. Uh, Mel's Diner's behind you. You've, you know, you've got years of touring. Yep videos mtv press like just it's a huge i mean it's a multi-platinum huge act yeah man we were we were we were rolling and um and the only thing it it got slightly derailed because of 9-11 like right when that record was coming out um i don't remember if it was right before or right after but maybe the record had been out, but the tour was supposed to go out, but because of nine 11 things yeah. got set back or whatever. There's well, somewhere the, sing- the singles I think were coming out because the record was November. I mean, it was close. I remember it being close to nine yeah. 11. So yeah. It, and, and, and like, that, a lot, like a lot of records that came out during that time, especially rock records that have dark themes and mm-hmm. you know, yeah, and, uh, it, it was a bit, it, it, it derailed it a bit. Um, but we still had, you know, massive tours and it was still, you know, it was still on a very upward trajectory at that, at that, at that point. Um, you know, and, um, but yeah, that, that was just a little bit of a setback somewhere in the midst of all that, but you know, it, it, it was, it was temporary. And then we went out and, you know, finished the the cycle. And then, um, and then whenever that was all done, we kind of just, we took a break because, uh, Rob went into, you know, movie making Rob. Well, and, 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 b- and b- before we talk about that, though, I want right. to jump back a little bit. Because um, Scott Humphrey did Sinister Urge also, right? Yep. Um, and then w- what's the process? Because when you came in on the first record, it was underway. So what was kind of the difference coming in with this one, you know, from yeah. the I, start? I, I don't like. The thing about like, you know, Zombie and Humphrey, like they, they had a very, they had a very tight, cohesive operation going on um, of how they, of how they, of how they operated. And it, so everything was very much constructed. You know, the foundation was very much constructed with those dudes. And then they would bring us in from time to time to kind of like flavor it up. Like, oh, we need a riff here. We need this here. And that record had a lot of guests like i think tommy lee played on uh, the track ozzy's on that, o- on that record ozzy sang D- on it DJ I think lethal Carrie, from house of pain and well, yeah. I guess the biscuit at the time but carrie um, king did a solo on yeah. one track and stuff so it felt like that was kind of the thing where the whereas the first record was sort of this thing where like we're not sure how this is going to work to where by the time you get to the second record they're just having fun yeah let's call up our buds and and let's do this. And, you know, and, and, and so that's what that was like, 
you know, but, you know, I mean, look, I mean, as a, as a writer or anything, like I didn't contribute, you know, significantly sure, sure. Yeah. to any, any, any of those records. But, but I mean, it was very, know, very much a machine in a, in a, in a good way of like, you, yeah. you know, you plugged in and you know what your role is and the record part of it. Um, yeah. And it was, it was cool just to be in the general circumference of that. I mean, to, 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 to go from like, man, I never had it, any idea from cryptic slaughter. Yeah. In Scott's garage to, Scott Humphrey's house in the Hollywood Hills with famous dudes. Like I, you know, I never, I never knew that was even possible. Yeah. So, you know, I was, and so, and, and I was Sister Urge, I think it's the last track on the album is called House of a Thousand Corpses. And yeah. of course now as we're sitting here in 2020, it's easy to think about Rob Zombie, the filmmaker, because he's made a whole bunch of movies. But yeah, at the time, as you touched upon uh, a minute ago, that was still a very new thing. The idea that Rob Zombie was going to, be a movie guy or that that was even possible because that was something he was really a trailblazer on as far as you know there were there were a lot of rappers and actors and people that had transitioned into acting roles but you didn't hear Mm -hmm. a lot about anyone successfully making the jump to screenwriter director you know I mean I think about now like you know Nick Cave writing screenplays and you know there's 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 examples but um, yeah. it was a pretty crazy thing for him to attempt, let alone succeed at. And then, and then the Corpses movie had that bumpy road to release where it, it changed hands between different studios. The fact that it even came out in light of all that is, is yeah. insane. Yeah. You know how that all. Yeah. I mean, out. he was, you know, he was directing. I mean, he was a, he was a pretty big time video director. Like, he did, you know, and that transition from, happens a lot, you know, McG. Yeah. Yeah. Michael May, yeah. I think directed music videos, maybe like, yeah, a bunch that was of- definitely common then. Yeah. And, you know, he had, he had done the, the zombie videos, but he had done a, you know, a, a, the ones that I remember, he did a black label video, he did an Aussie video. Um, and I'm sure there's a countless, I think he maybe made a prong video. Um, and I'm, there's probably, you know, a handful of others that I don't remember, but that was where he was, that was where he was learning the craft. Right. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then transitioning that, but like, yeah, that's, that's kind of part of his geniusness of like making the song before the movie mm-hmm. to where, you know, and, and throughout his career, he's always str- like been able to mesh his worlds, right. His universes, he's been able to mesh them through one another and, and, you go, you go out on a tour and then you got the video screen and you play the trailer for the movie that's coming out next month. And here's the theme song. And you know what I mean? Like, it's just this immersive universe that he's created Mm -hmm. that once you get in there, man, it's just like, it's a page turner, you know, like I was this over here and like, you can find Easter eggs all day long. So um, it's, it's kind of cool. I think that's one of the things I think by observation that I really admired to pick up on is just his intense and expansive, vision on the little zombie brand you know yeah it's amazing it's one of those things that makes it um timeless you know and he's also and he's also hit upon themes by by digging into the b movies and the horrors and the pre-code era comic Mm -hmm. books and all that stuff that he's into it gives it a timelessness where stuff that he was doing creatively in the 80s 90s 2000s 2010s to into 2020 none of it feels dated because it mm-hmm. was always otherworldly, you know? Yep. So you, don't, yep. you don't hear one of those songs or see one of those videos and go like, ah, oh, that's, I can tell what year that was as you can mm-hmm. with a lot of bands and stuff. So what was the transition then into, you know, so Rob's making movies, but then there was the educated horses record. And that one is a different lineup. That's when John five, who's his guitar player now, came into the band um yeah and uh tommy who's now who's the drummer in ozzy right he was the drummer yep. on educated horses yep so how, so how did that you know how did all that come together you know you don't have to get into the nitty-gritty of people leaving and joining the band and stuff like that but like what was the yeah i the mean genesis that, that, of that, that record because that record feels like an anomaly in the in the catalog for a, a few different reasons yeah, I mean, it does. There was there was maybe stuff that makes sense, but maybe 
makes sense to him and where he's coming from. But something like Foxy Foxy was maybe uh, going like, hmm, uh, I mean, that might be a little left of center of, yeah. of uh, what, someone's, some of fans or what, what, what someone's thinking, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but that's kind of also part of his uniqueness of like mm -hmm. not being predictable. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, you know, he called me up and he's like, Hey, I want to make another record and I'm going to mix it up a little bit and try some different things. And I was like, yeah, dude, of course. Like I, at that point I was working a day job, you know what I mean? Like, of yeah. course. Um, and, uh, so and you had thought so, in that period in between that he was done with music. Oh no, I thought it was like, martin scorsese land okay so yeah. that it yeah because i know there was a point where he was like i am done <laughs> yeah no, more, no yeah. more band i'm gonna make movies and then he yeah decided he and and by that time then sorry if my timeline is a little wacky so 2006 okay so well to back up a little bit <laughs> so rob tells you i'm gonna go make movies you guys all do what you gotta do it's it's been mm. cool and you all shake hands and part ways at some point after that is when you got the opportunity to audition for Ozzy. Right. I did. Yeah. Yeah. And then you I get the Ozzy you. gig. I, I think you were the first dude I called. Yeah. Well, I, I vividly remember that conversation. Um, it was amazing. It was incredible. Uh, it was a huge day. Um, but it wasn't long after that when Ozzy got into that semi-famous uh, ATV accident. Yep. Where he was severely hurt and yep. it was in question whether he would ever perform again, let alone make records totally. or tour. So here you've had the zombie thing. It's amazing. It comes to its conclusion and you're like, maybe this will be as good as it ever gets. Then suddenly you get the Aussie gig and that's insane. But then nothing happens with the Aussie thing <laughs> through no fault of his, obviously. Uh, but, and then that's how you end up your, back working a day job when Rob calls you up and says, Hey, I actually do want to do music again. I'm, I'm re-inspired. Yeah. I'm reinvigorated. I've got this new guitar player. Would you want to be yeah. part of another record? Yeah. He's like, I, I, I called, I met John, like Andy had introduced him to John and he's like, I met this guy, John, and he wants to do right. And I go, Oh yeah, dude, I've, I've known John since, since the club days, you know, yeah. like we, he had, he had a, he had a band called Alligator Soup back in the day, and uh, um, and so and we did, we did gigs. So I've known John forever, so yeah, it was that was uh, those were fun times. But yeah, and so we we put that together, and it was very kind of similar, um, uh, in that it was back up at Scott's house, you know, mm -hmm. same place, a um, little bit different, but for the most part, I mean, I think we were involved a little bit more in this one in terms of coming on up and, you know, dumping some stuff down, but it was relatively the same process from what I remember of like Rob and Scott kind of developed the, the sort of core foundation and we would kind of come in and, you know, drop some riffs and mm -hmm. stuff on top or whatever. But, you know, once again, man, happy just to get that call because by all yeah. means, by all means, they didn't need to call me to come up and put bass down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it, it it it's not like it, it's not like something that couldn't have happened. So I'm appreciative of the fact that they even bothered to call me and have me involved. You know. And I remember actually seeing. I just so happened by luck of the draw to be at your final performance with Rob, which was at one of the K Rock shows, right? The Weenie Rose. Yeah, and you introduced me to the AFI guys. Yeah, that was that same day. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know what? I think I was there. I think I was covering it for MTV. Yeah. I think so, depending on what year that wow. was. Maybe not, actually. Yeah, probably not, because that would be later. Anyway, nobody watching this cares about what I was doing that day. <laughs> what is, I was there, and I saw, and I saw the big hug you guys gave each other afterwards. So, I mean, it, it was, yeah. I think, just, just happenstance then, right, that as Rob is getting momentum as a musician again, Ozzy's now back up on his feet he's ready to get back at it. You are his bass player. You know, you took the gig in good faith when you didn't have a gig. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yep. so then it was right. Just kind of a natural. You, yeah. And now they, there's a lot more like people being in more than one band and whatever, but I think just logistically that wasn't going to be possible. Right. Cause they were going to be touring. No, there was, there was a moment when I was straddling, 
the, or juggling the two. Um, but that, yeah, that, that became impractical, you know. Yeah, and I mean, Black quickly. Rain came out the year after Educated Horses. Yeah. So, I mean, it was really close. It was over. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so the Aussie thing happened. And then um, they, he had a house in Beverly Hills at the time. And, but, th- but they're in the back guest house was converted into a studio. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and that was, and that was the first time I had met Kevin Churko and he was the one that was producing the record. And it was, it was interesting, right? Because it was, it was, it was relatively the same process. Like, like it's almost like Scott Humphrey and Kevin Churko are sort of cut from the same producer cloth, right? Mm-hmm. Like coming from the same place in in terms of, um, you know, very much in control of, of the foundation. You know, they, they, they understand how to, how to write. They understand how to track, you know, to where at, at any point you pop your head in to what's going on. And it sounds like a finished master, you know, it just, yeah. it, it just, they, they mix as they go along, which, which for me was a new thing, mm-hmm. right? Cause you know, coming, coming well, from, again, talking about going full circle to cryptic slaughter, playing like your band practice, you know, yeah, yeah. it wouldn't be any, yeah, yeah. Any but, different. but, so this was, this was somewhat very similar to making a zombie record almost, um, and in, in hindsight, the records, like, those Aussie records that I was on, and those, those zombie records I was on, have a similarity to them, sonically mm-hmm. speaking, mm-hmm. they do, um, and, and, uh, and so I find that interesting in hindsight, but, yeah, yeah but, um, but, um, uh, uh, Kevin, it was kind of it was kind of the same sort of thing where it was like they would build the foundation. They kind of had a general sense of what the song was. There was already already vocals on it on some level, mm-hmm. and we would just come in to just drop in the the spice, you know, yeah. the, the salt and pepper, um, and uh, uh, and stuff. So, but once again, man, like I'm like, oh, pff, dude, why am I? Why am I here? Like, why am I here playing? On I'm happy Aussie to be record? here, but why? <laughs> yeah, but this is insane. Yeah, like this. This is this is, cr- and and then keep in mind too that it's like, Ozzy, Mike Borden, Faith No More, and Zach Wild. Zach Wild. I'm like, I'm like really like, w- this is crazy town. You know? Yeah, I mean and, that was uh, that that Ozzy lineup. Like a lot of Ozzy lineups, is was is a super group. Yeah, I mean, and you included at that point. You were the guy from Rob Zombie, you know. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, I guess so. Faith no more, yeah. and Zach, and yeah. I mean, it was you know, and, and Ozzy's always been very smart about either discovering and developing those people or recruiting those people when they've yeah. been developed a little bit, and that's you know how he's ended up with you know these yeah. killer lineups. And at this point, without doing the math, <laughs> I probably should have done the math before we talked. <laughs> Is there a bass player that's been with Ozzy longer than you at this point? Mm, I don't know. Well, I, know I mean, you know, I know discography wise, it's only a couple of records, but in terms of years, which includes tours and videos yeah. and festivals and everything that comes along with it. I mean, you've been in the band now for a long time. Yeah. Long time. I don't know. I never really thought about it. Yeah. Um, I always think about how Tommy Stinson was in Guns N' Roses longer than Duff McKagan was. <laughs> right. Like, Those things happen when it takes you 15 years to make a record. <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, man, it was great. And, you know, and the record came out and went on tour and it was cool. And then making the, the, the second record was real, real quick, right before we jump to the second record, yeah. that house that you described with the studio in the back, that's the Osborne's house, right? From the TV show. No, no, that no. Are you sure? Yeah, pretty sure. I'm pretty sure they moved to that one after the Osbournes. Correct. So the Osbournes was filmed at a place that was also in Beverly Hills, but around the corner from this place. Okay. So I must have never actually been to the Osbournes house because I because I went to that house that had the studio in it. There was an Ozfest press conference there, probably like 2002 or three that mm-hmm. I went to, and then I did an interview with Ozzy for MTV News there was just a one-on-one and it was at his house. And one of the greatest moments of my entire life was after the interview was over and my crew's packing up and it's just, it's literally just me and him sitting there. 
um, he starts telling me that he's building a studio in the backyard and do I want to come check it out? And we walk in the backyard, go in the studio. And I don't know who, it might've been Kevin Churko actually, because I didn't really, I didn't know him. There was an engineer or somebody in there and Ozzy tells him to just turn something on. And it just yeah. happened to be what he pulled up was After Forever, which is literally my favorite Black Sabbath song. Oh, right. And it was just, yeah. you know, and just, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps even just telling you the story. I'm shoulder to shoulder with Ozzy, speakers blasting After Forever in his home studio in his backyard. And we're standing there. And then there was just a moment where he didn't say anything, but there was just a moment where I could just kind of sense like, okay, we're done. You know? Yeah, yeah sure. Like, that's like, that's him. You know, yep. and, yep. Uh, and yeah, I said goodbye and yeah, it was amazing. And then years later, I don't know how many years later, maybe 10 years later, I got a, a call from MTV as a freelancer to go interview Christina Aguilera at her house. And so I go over there and they let me in and I'm, I'm waiting in her kitchen for a minute and then they come get me and she's got a studio in her backyard and they bring me into the studio. And as I'm walking into that studio, I'm like, this house, this, stu- this place is really familiar. Mm-hmm. And I go to open the door to the studio and there's a, a, like a cross, an Aussie cross on the doorknob. Yep. And I open the door and I go, did, this, did Ozzy used to live here? And she's <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, this is this Ozzy and Sharon, this was their house. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's <laughs> she, it. She had redone the studio and everything looked different in the studio except all the doorknobs, all the fixtures still had. Yep, the crosses. crosses on the doorknobs. Yep, totally. So, that's hilarious. Yeah, so that house, that's where you did the, did the Black yep. Rain record. And then, yeah, and then going into the next record, which was Scream, which, man, how was that? That was 10 years ago. How was that 10 years ago? It feels yeah, like that's right? two years ago. Yeah. Um, that one is uh, Gus G, right? Yep. You know, so a few little changes but once again the process was pretty much the same except for we just did it at a different house you know they had moved to they had moved to hidden hills at that point and so they had a you know they built a studio in that house yeah and um uh, and that was actually in the basement or something it was very cool um and who's and, the drummer on that one like a josh freese maybe i don't remember let me see if i have it somewhere actually I don't remember because it was. It wasn't like we were ever in the same room at the same time. Right. There might not even be a drummer on that record. There <laughs> might that not. Right? <laughs> That's possible. Because Adam Wakeman's on that. You're on it. Yeah. SG. I don't know that there's a drummer on that record. I will look that up and put that in the notes if I'm wrong. Yeah, but at anyway. th- th- but at this point, I had known. You know, I'd been around for a minute. I built a relationship with Kevin and stuff. So I was given I was given a little bit more time and freedom to work with Kevin on bass parts and stuff on this record in particular. And um and uh and I was less nervous too. Like on the first record, I was just like, Oh, I just wanna like kill it and go away. Whereas this one I you know, I, I spent some time and, and Kevin was accommodating to try stuff and and uh, and so that was cool. So that was that was that was a pretty that was a pretty fun record to make. And I think a lot of the stuff was sort of in different stages of disarray. And then he would just chop it up and make it all work, you know, around. Yeah. You know, he's a he's a he's a mad scientist um, in that way. And and then and then and then that was it, man. That was the you know that was uh that was a fun record to make though. We did some fun stuff with that. And that's really, I think not many people music fans are aware how often records happen like this because i think we have this image in our minds of bands in the practice space hammering out the songs practicing them over and over and over and over going in the studio tracking it and it gets mixed and it comes out and while certainly there are lots of records that were made that way and some that still are so many records including rock records are made much more like the way you're describing where it, it's yeah. ideas, especially when you're established enough that it's the full-time gig and you have the freedom to be able to put ideas down here and there and cobble things together, like you said, and have a producer who's, you know, a lot, I shouldn't say a lot, but some rock producers 
are really just really great engineers. Mm. And they can get all the sounds and the tones and they can inspire the band to give the best performances and they produce in that sense. But then there's producers like a Churko, like a Zeus who Rob works with now, like John Feldman, where they're like really, they're, they're in it in a much different way. They're like, they have kind of a vision of what the overview is and totally how to get, it's the artist's record, but, but how to get what you need from them to make their vision come to life, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Almost, almost like the, like the, like an Ozzy or a Rob or somebody is like a screenwriter. And then these producers come in and they're like the cinematographer and special effects person or something, you know, like yeah, executing their vision. Um, and I think, you know, there, it's, there's no value judgment for me anyway. It's, they're all uh, equally valid ways to make art, you know, and there's totally. records that have been made every imaginable way that are just as good and or bad as, as any other record. Yeah. So, Agreed. Yeah, some of the, I mean, you know, the Doors didn't have a bass player. <laughs> yeah, right, for sure. <laughs> you know, and, and yet, and yet, it's the Doors. So yeah, yeah. so the Scream record um, was the last real official release on your discography. Here's yeah. an interesting question to wrap us up. Given the number of things that you're involved in as a very creative person and as a business minded person and, and the way that you've taken and I, and I think people probably understand this if they made it this far into our conversation that all of these experiences that you've had sometimes as a passenger, sometimes as a very active participant, that's where all of your, that's how you become a manager, right? <laughs> like you've, you experienced so many of those things. You saw so many different sides of it. You know how different things worked in different eras, what's failed, what's succeeded, and you take those things and you're able to apply them to your artists and work just the way you've always worked as a creative person in the music industry, but sitting in a different seat, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Totally. Uh, would that be fair to describe it that way? Yeah, I mean, and, and it's hilarious too to riff off of what you're saying to where you take all of that stuff that you're saying, right? As a person that is coming at you with a relatively wide observation of experience, and yet some of these bands still think that they know it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, old man. You just go over there and you yeah. make shit happen or whatever. We'll be over uh, yeah. here fucking some of these bands knowing it all. Some of these bands, you're Bill Matoyer and they're cryptic slaughter, right? Yep. No doubt. I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> Pull it together. You know, I want to help you, but yeah, totally. Of course. Uh, so last question. Uh, do you think, give, I mean, you have, first of all, enough under your belt, enough plaques on the wall. I mean, you could have you could have been finished discography wise of cryptic slaughter and still have like some cool music behind you that you have to do something cool. And then you had the whole major label experience and that's a whole experience. And you were, were Rob Zombie's bass player. Now you're Ozzy's bass player. So there's, there's no, there's no shame in the fact if you never play on another record again and you have so much else happening in your life and career right now that there's probably not even room for it. But with that being said, do you want to make another record? Obviously, there's the Zach Sabbath stuff, which is which is a a whole different thing because obviously those are, those are Black Sabbath songs, and it's you and Jack and Joey C. But do you have that impulse or that that desire of like, yeah, I got I've got more records in me. I want to like, you know, whether it's with Ozzy, whether it's a, a different project or your own band, or is that is that a reoccurring thought ever? Well, I, it's funny because, you know, amidst the, the pandemic Zoom sessions that yeah. everyone is doing, like, yeah. so, you know, Phil Demo calls me and he goes, hey, man, like, uh, we're going to do this cover and uh, I want you to play bass on it. 
and stuff. And I was like, yeah, fuck, sounds cool. And he's like, you know, this person's going to be on it and this person's going to be on it. I go, yeah, th thanks for calling me, man. I appreciate it. And I, and I go, and how does that work? <laughs> he goes, he goes, well, I'll make the, I'll, I'll do the track and then I'll send you the MP3 and then you go into your studio and you lay down your shit. And I go, not only do I not have a studio at my house, I don't even think I have a bass in my house. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. So he goes, well, I, you're out then. <laughs> Too bad to you. And I was like, yeah, dude, like, like, I'm not like a real musician, right? Like at this point, like, I work behind the scenes primarily if Ozzy calls and goes, goes, dude, we're going on tour. I, I, I will break the thing out. I, I, I blow the cobwebs and dust off of it. Sure. And crazy train is just like riding a bike, you know? Yeah. And, 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 um, and stuff. But, funny that you asked because it, this is one thing that has sort of been in my mind for no reason as of late of like, man, like, I wonder if, I wonder if I got another one in me. Like, I wonder if I called some friends that are in cool bands and, you know, bands that I think are cool. And I put together sort of like this little sort of miniature stoner rock doom. I was band. just, I was just about to say it's gotta be a you doom know. record. Yeah. Like, you know, almost like a, like a shrine builder type thing to where it's like this, you know, who's who of hip dudes. And, and, I, and, and we, and we throw together a bunch of ideas and they come up with something. It's been on my mind or whatever. I probably will never get around to doing it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the, so the last thing that I did was we re-recorded the, the first Sabbath record. Yes. And we're, we're going to, we're going to release that. And, um, and, and, you know, Zach Sabbath did that. And that was really fun. And, um, and we may do another one of those and that would, and that would be exciting, you know, but like for me, like, I feel like, like, I'm just not a writer. Like I'm a fan. Like I love listening to music that I go, fuck, that's so cool. I would have never thought of that, you know? And, um, and, uh, so I just like to be, you know, I just like to be on the team, you know, but I don't know, man. I, you know, the, the thing about my career has been one of those things whenever like I got to prong. And, and I had gone to Japan for the first time and I had played European festivals for the first time. I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. And this right. is probably right. where it's going to end. Right. You know, and the, the things just keep happening. So I almost kind of reserve the right to answer the question at a later date. Yes. Because it's That's like, you know, I, feel, I feel like something else is just going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Know, where it's unexpected. So good. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, much like we were talking about that final cryptic record, it, sometimes the great, you know, the magic is in the things that <laughs> I don't want to put the message out there that you shouldn't try, but you don't have to overthink it, things all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it, like yeah. you can have, you can have your master plan and work diligently to check off everything on your list, but you can't necessarily predict what some of the, great amazing things are going to be you know case in point okay this this zombie thing is going to be maybe a summer worth of touring while he gets it out of his system and goes back to his band or you know you you, just, you couldn't predict a lot of the things that happened but what was consistent was that you stayed involved you stayed interested you stayed passionate you were always mm -hmm. into this day discovering new music and excited by it and you know <laughs> of our of our friends and peers in our industry who are who are in our age group and stuff like that i don't know anyone else who is as excited about new music as you are and that's not to diss anybody but yeah. for the people that i you know all my buddies you know we all text with each other and stuff like that like <laughs> there's very few where, that, that are in that mindset of like have you heard this right like, agenda free check this out like you and i have a check this out relationship that's yeah. not based on i'm thinking about managing these guys or, or <laughs> totally. you know i want to put these guys on this tour or i'm going to interview them or whatever like um and if anything there's even i think stuff that you and i both love where we appreciate our distance from it professionally yes you know there's totally there's, there's entire genres where i'm you know i got really yeah. into going to see stand-up comedy a few years ago 
and I realized, and this is, I don't know, this is the first world problems, right? But I realized a big thing of what I enjoyed about it was I'm not in that scene. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm just, I'm queued up with my ticket, like every other punter. Yeah. I have a decent seat and, you know, I'm not, not yeah. on the guest list. I'm not, I don't know the tour manager, right. tour manage this other comedian. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's, I'm just, I'm a fan. And that's not to say totally. I'm very blessed and very excited and happy about my whole career. And I love working in our business, but there is a, um, a certain kind of purity of just enjoying something. <laughs> I agree, man. I agree, hundred percent. So, and I've been fortunate. I mean, man, like, because I think that this is a good way to wrap it up. Is like, I've been fortunate, very, very fortunate, that all these situations that I've been in, whether it's my own thing or hired gun thing, this is all music that I love. Yes. Because there are career hired guns that play in stuff that they probably can't stand that is so 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 i I think i've been very fortunate and very lucky that every gig that i've been in has just been unbelievably awesome that i could play such amazing songs with guys that wrote wrote it right you know such a wealth of catalog um you know prong danzig rob zombie ozzy osbourne like it's it's helmet. it's really there's a minute in helmet, helmet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's 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 re- like it's it's really great how like the music that i love i've been able to be a part of even if it's on the fringes or just a live guy or whatever like it's just been it's been you know i'm gonna look back on it fondly on the day that it maybe finally ends like it it will have i will have been very lucky that i was able to do all of that that is awesome and i will add as one quick coda to that it's a, it's a real testament to your character, the reputation that you have. Not only have, have you gotten to play with all, this, all these musicians who've created all this music that you love and, and shared in it with them, but in my experience, and this is very uncommon, <laughs> when, those, when those situations came to their natural conclusions, you were always on good terms. You're yeah. never... You've never been the guy where there's this bitter falling out or there's a feud or there's a blabbermouth headline where Blasco says this about so-and-so and and -and so-and-so says this about Blasco. And and, and again, some people get wrapped up in that stuff and it's not their fault, but um, you know, knock on wood, I think it really speaks to your character and just who you are as a dude and why I'm, you know, consider you a close friend and why we love working together on stuff is because at this point you start to figure out that, the most important thing at the end of the day, at the end of the day are people. And I think, yeah, man, yeah, you're a great bass player. You're a great performer. That's all awesome. There's a million great performers and musicians out there. And I think if, anything, sure. if anybody, if there's that one big takeaway for people to get from this conversation who are maybe looking to be in bands and stuff like that, like just be a good person, mm-hmm. <laughs> be someone that shows up to Mel's diner ready to hang on time on yeah. time <laughs> you know? yeah yeah exactly man that's awesome well dude thank you so much dude. for taking the Thanks deep dive me. with me that was for deep sure. that was fun and uh i will chat with you again soon and cool people know where to find you you're on social media yeah. we're all on social media of course. they can it's they can look for you he's blasco You'll find him. Yeah. thank you sir i'll talk to you thanks buddy appreciate it later